ultimately, if we're open and we have a lucid type dream experience, then that's because God wants to speak to us that way. Um, it could be that it's, it's more difficult for him to speak to us while we're awake for other reasons, whether we're distracted or, you know, sometimes it can be more difficult at times when you're asleep, you're asleep and there's less you know, conscious activity around you, which can be a distraction because that's all all outside of your um, ability to to interpret that when you're asleep. So, yeah, ask him, show, see if he's got some insight for you um, and has particularly uh, a purpose for each encounter that you're having. Um, but I don't see a difference between lucid dreams and visions lucid visions they're basically the same sort of encounter just one when you're asleep and one when you're awake i actually wanted to ask about dreams um in this session um because i've i've had a pretty wild dream recently and um i wanted to ask you a few things like about um lucid dreaming and about um, people visiting you, you in your dreams. So I wanted your thoughts about, um, with lucid dreaming, it's happened before, um, but it's never anything I can ever control. It just, it happens. I realize I'm in a dream. It's not something I go to bed thinking I'm going to, you know, be alert when I dream. It just happens that I realize I'm in a dream and I have control over what I do. Um, and this is the first time I've ever had um, a famous person in the dream. And it just came to the point where I realized this is not my brain um, making this person here. And it's it's really a person visiting me. Um, so I've had that. And the other one is, is what do we do with people that we don't know? We've never seen them before, but they're in our dreams. So that that's my question. It, it's kind of three things, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, dreams, I'm not really the best person to ask about dreams in terms of godly dreams, because I don't get that many, if, if hardly any, in that mm -hmm. sense. I, I'm aware that God does speak to people through dreams. Um, but the, the sort of differentiation between a lucid dream and a vision is only that you're asleep rather than being awake when you have it. So they're basically the same thing, but in a different format of one being asleep and one being awake. Because if you are conscious of what's going on in the dream and you're engaging with the dream, there's no difference in being conference uh, you know, in a vision and having an encounter and engaging that vision. So it's just a way sometimes, I guess, that God can engage with us when we're not in control of our conscious thinking, like being asleep. Um, if, you're, if it's a lucid dream and you're interacting with it, then is it a dream that God is giving you and you're in an encounter with God and the other people who come into the dream are then part of that encounter, either they're visionary in that God is showing you a person and interacting or that person's spirit is engaging in your dream. Um, so again, it's all down to what is God's purpose for it? You know, and therefore you've got to go back to God and ask him, to show you what was he trying to communicate what was the significance of a particular person whether known or unknown within your dream um just like a lot of people have visionary experiences but don't know what they're about then they have to go back to god and ask them um in that if you're interacting with the dream and things are happening those things can be actual things that are going on, or they could be symbolic of something that's going on. And again, you have to discern that, you know, a lot of the occasions where I would be engaging things, visionary encounters, experiences, I was there engaging it and the things were happening to me. Um, and if I was in conversation with God within that experience, then I could trust what he was saying. If God wasn't there and I was seeing things, doing things and that sort of thing, then I'm going to be more cautious 
on my interpretation of what's happening. And usually then I would check out what happened with with God to ensure that I wasn't putting my own spin on it. You know, when I first encountered, let's say, the um, high chancellor's houses and wisdom took me there and I engaged with the high chancellors and all of the houses, God was nowhere <laughs> in that encounter. I believe God totally inspired that encounter and wisdom interacted with me in, in many different ways as on God's behalf. Um, but I always went back and said, OK, I need deeper insight into this. What were you trying to show me? You know, I want to make sure that this is a pure experience that I'm not spinning through my own filters or trying to understand through my own experiences. So I would always be more cautious when God was with me, showing me something, speaking to me, then I was more confident that, OK, I'm sure this is God and whatever's going on, we may have a future conversation about it or I'm aware of what he was trying to show me or he tells me something that is very clear. He's also told me things that are not very clear. Um, I didn't mistrust what he said. I just didn't understand what he was said at that point. Then that usually lodges in me, in my heart, and that usually outworks in a future situation where, ah, now I understand what that was about. Because God says something to stimulate my attention to think, I don't know what he's talking about or I'm not I'm not fully understanding this. So then I might pursue what the understanding of it is when it comes to a person. I have encountered people or people have certainly told me that they've encountered me in a vision or in a heavenly experience. And. I didn't remember those experiences because I was asleep at the time and they were usually at night and my spirit engaged them. But when I then focused on, OK, sometimes the, my spirit gave me information that affirmed that encounter. It was like, oh, yeah. And it was sort of like my spirit said, yes, we I did. Um, and sometimes I'll say, well, what do we talk about? And then when they sort of described the conversation or the, what went on, it was very much, I totally was in sync with what they said I'd said. So it was like, yeah, that was what I would have said if, if we had that conversation. So, you know, you get these sort of different ways in which you experience and encounter things. And they're all good. You know, um, every time I go to sleep at night, I make my spirit available for whatever it is God might want me to do outside of all the other things I'm doing, you know, because I'm constantly doing lots of things. So this is just, hey, I'm available for anything you might want me to engage with. And that could be engaging other people. Um, often those people will gain something from the experience that they're seeking I can't remember engaging a person in that type of visionary thing where I was seeking that, but I have engaged with the cloud of witnesses for specific things that I felt there might be some insight here or engaging a person for a particular reason as part of the cloud of witnesses um, that God sort of put on my heart or that they engaged me first and I went back and engaged them later. I engaged Esther, I engaged David, Daniel, Jacob, uh, Joshua, a number of people at various times during my journey that I went back and re-engaged them at a future date and to find out more about it. So there's no real difference between a person who is alive and you engaging their spirit in a dream or a vision or someone who's physically dead, but you're still engaging their spirit soul within a vision. So, you know, I wouldn't separate the two. They're just, you know, Hebrews describes them, you know, as the firstborn enrolled in heaven, if you like. Um, so they're still active and we can still engage them. Um, so in a sense, 
I would one of the questions I would ask is can I have these experiences when I'm not awake when I'm when I am awake when I'm not sleeping because I want to then be able to engage the experience you know I journal everything so I want a record of the things that I've encountered and if you wake up having had that experience it's harder perhaps to maybe journal exactly what happened within a dream type setting a visionary setting you know i have come back and then in, engaged and written those things out but actually mostly what i do in journaling is journal while i'm having the experience so that i'm totally aware and completely lucid in that i'm writing down what was happening during that experience with god or any other encounter that i might have had then it is then something that I'm writing out as I'm having it. And therefore it, it becomes instantly recorded as I'm going through the experience. Occasionally I might go back to that experience because I feel there may be some detail I missed. Because uh, often when I'm listening and talking to God, I'm not really looking anything about what's going on around me, particularly unless he's pointing something out or, showing me something so i often would um go back and ensure that i had the full encounter particularly in the early days when i was sort of exploring and all this was very new but things that happened in those experiences were like whoa what is all this about you know so quite often i would revisit the experience um just to make sure that i didn't miss something but as time went on, I was much more confident in my ability to be able to discern and write down and to engage um, that. Um, so, yeah, ask God, can I, can I have these experiences when I'm not sleeping, please? <laughs> um, and, and see what happens. And you know, if there is a particular person that you're unsure about what you should do about that, then uh, again, ask the father to show you. Sometimes a person may appear in a dream that causes you then to think, oh, should I be praying for that person or should I be looking to in some way protect that person or, you know, you know, you know until you sort of get in the flow of it and find out what was behind it, then there could be lots of different specifics with a person. And sometimes that a person may speak to you and tell you something. Just like a prophet could come and prophesy over you and tell you God's saying this to you, sometimes a person can be speaking uh, on God's behalf, um, which is what I think I've done a number of times with people when I've engaged them in that realm. So, you know, ultimately, there's not a right or wrong anything in it. It's all part of learning to discover and journey through encounters and experiences um so that we become more able in discernment to be able to pick up these things and ultimately if we're open and we have a lucid type dream experience then that's because god wants to speak to us that way um it could be that it's, it's more difficult for him to speak to us while we're awake for other reasons whether we're distracted or you know, sometimes it can be more difficult at times when you're asleep, you're asleep and there's less, you know, conscious activity around you, which can be a distraction because that's all all outside of your um, ability to, to interpret that when you're asleep. So, yeah, ask him, show, see if he's got some insight for you um, and has particularly uh, a purpose for each encounter that you're having um but i don't see a difference between lucid dreams and visions lucid visions they're basically the same sort of encounter just one when you're asleep and one when you're awake but, yeah i noticed you said that you know god speaks to you and you know it's him speaking to you in the in the dream i don't think i've ever had a dream where i would say god was directly speaking to me it's more like symbols and people and things going on in the dream and then afterwards i ask holy spirit and i get his interpretation of what he's saying to me so for me i i 
I, I don't, there isn't much of a difference between um, realizing I'm in a dream and a dream that I don't realize I'm in because it's not really God speaking to me in, in that direct yeah. way, more of like just the symbols and stuff. But yeah. there is some where I just, you know, become aware that I'm, I'm dreaming. And, and that's, that's a fairly recent thing for me. Um, maybe because I only became aware that it's actually a thing. It could happen, and it's not something I've ever been able to decide on. It just suddenly, I just realized yeah. this is yeah. a dream. Yeah. Mm. I would look to pursue the relationship with God in which you do have conversations and experiences with him directly. Oh, um, I do. I do yeah. in visions yeah. and in, in yeah. time with him, but not in the way that you're talking about in dreams. I, I've never had him talking to me in the dream it's more like people are talking to me and things are happening and later yeah, sure. i ask him yeah. what is this about and he talks to me so um maybe it's something i can ask can you speak to me directly in a dream rather than just yeah maybe so i i can remember someone someone i was talking about angels and someone came up to me and said well you know i'm not sure about all these angels things you know if can i see an angel and and i said well okay then let me ask god about it and so what i did is i talked to god i said look this guy's obviously needs a bit of affirmation or confirmation about these supernatural type things i said can i send one of my angels to go and visit him in a dream mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and god said yeah of course you can so i engaged my angel to go and visit him in a dream and it was a very specific angel which was a white winged horse so it was a very clear thing. He wasn't going to mistake it for anything else. <laughs> so then when the guy came back the next Sunday, I said to him, how did you get on? And he, and he, I said, look, before you say anything, let me tell you what I think you might have experienced. And he was like, what? I said, did you see a white winged horse in your dream? And he said, yes. How did you know that? I said that was my angel visiting you while you were asleep um, and that was a lot of confirmation for him because you know that for him was very out of the ordinary that anything like that would happen to him and me being able to tell him what I'd done was an affirmation then that that must have been real mm -hmm. and he didn't just make it up mm -hmm. so, Thank you. yeah okay all right. Okay. All right. I, I have a question. Yep. Okay. So uh, mine's about brooding with the father, Mike. And um, oh. I was, I was uh, before father this morning and I began thinking of a scripture, uh, a promise that father had given me years ago. And I, I just thought to wonder if I should brood in father's heart over this, you know, because I'm thinking, um, I'm understanding brooding as um, incubating, you know, uh, and I felt that this promise was like a seed. And I, so I went, I took the promise and I went in the father's heart and began incubating and brooding and coming into agreement with his heart and, and flow. Mm -hmm. And, and then I, I, I'm assuming that, that I now need to birth this, I need to speak it out. I need to call it forth. And yeah. so uh, am I, does that sound like a, a right yeah. flow? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in a sense, what I found in, in brooding in that place where you are engaging with God's desires and his intentions, and that is beginning to shape your desires and intentions to come into a resonant agreement you are then vibrating effectively with that frequency of his desire, you then become his voice. So then when you speak, you're speaking with the authority of his voice. That means you have that creative power to call that into being, to birth it, manifest it, whatever it might be, because now everything recognizes your voice as his voice yeah because you are speaking with full authority of 
act working his heart expressing it and and i would you know symbolically for me when when i had brooded and i felt like i'm energized by his intentions and i really feel you know compelled sometimes to how do i how do i sort of now follow this through for me waterfalls were always a, a quite an important part of my journey and i would go and engage the sound of many waters which is his voice is like the sound of many waters so i'd go and stand under this waterfall and i would allow myself to be completely saturated in the sound of many waters and then behind that waterfall there was this cave which was a chamber that i uh began to outwork destiny from and i met enoch there he directed me in particular quests to do so it fit for me and this is just for me and i'm not saying this is everyone has to do it the same way for me it's like i brewed within the cradle of life within something that is sort of beginning to come into a life and i become the vehicle of that then coming into life i then affirm that by sort of being his voice and i do that in the waterfall i go into that chamber um, and i then seek how is this in line with who i am because i don't want to do things just because i could do them or even if god had given me this you now have the authority to do this I don't want to do that in any way which is out of sync with who I am. So that chamber of destiny is like, this is where I begin to find how I can express his voice creatively through our, who I am, rather than through a technique or through a formula. I go there and it almost creativity is birthed in me of how I'm going to do this because i don't always just call things into being or you know it, i do things in different ways and often then once i'd been in there and i felt now i i can uh, work this in a creative way i go into the chamber of uh, creation and i then engage with light so the living light quantum lumens which form every all reality they are going to be the manifestation of reality out of the desire that i'm about to birth so now i don't think you have to do all of that physically or go to all of those places but for me it's a mental checklist of going through this creative process ensuring that i'm in line and then when when i do speak and i could call forth or i could decree or declare then that light is living energized waiting to be directed into a particular reality and sometimes if it's a larger shift in reality then i could go there with other people and we would be in agreement over what we were calling forth rather than me just doing it individually. Now, I can call forth around my life. I can call forth in the spheres that I have authority in. But sometimes if I want something global to change, you know, it, it isn't just going to happen necessarily if I just say change. You know, sometimes there's power in the agreement that when you come together in agreement, then you have a multiplied effect, if you like. So for me, the process... Uh, was one that I learned uh, and it helps me to ensure that I follow the desire of God through in a creative way but not in a way which is me trying to make something happen or yeah you know, I, I feel the process for me gives me checks and balances along the way to ensure that what i'm at working is god's heart now when when once i engaged a group of guardians in a council 
and they asked me to create some more guardians, I had not brooded in the father's heart and I had not in any way come into agreement with that. So it was like I was a bit circumspect of, I'm not sure about that. So I just said, well, I'm going to go and check it out. <laughs> not just taking your word for it, basically. Not that I said that, but I thought it. So it was like, okay. So I went to the father and I said, look, I've been asked. And he said, yeah, I know. So so my first question is, well, why, why is there a deficit of guardians? And then he basically said, well, because we have left a, quite a number of things for you to complete. Not me personally, but us to complete. And this was one thing that I was part of completing. So I was like, oh, OK, so it's OK then. Yeah, it's OK. So then I, wouldn't, I, I didn't immediately go and do anything. I sort of hung around. And I felt that the father was saying, well, why are you hanging around? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I was a bit like, really? Am I really going to go and do this? You know? um, and, and he then affirmed, look, you know how to do this. You know how to put this process in place. So for me, his affirmation was, I was now in agreement. I didn't have to go and brood over a long time. I was instantly in agreement because he had given me that affirmation that this was his purpose. And then I knew then that I could go and do it. Now, I didn't go to the chamber of creation and do it as I might have done differently. I felt I needed to go back to the guardians. And it was like I was definitely pregnant with this possibility and i just released those guardians from that inner desire you know and guardians formed quite a number of them formed and you know but i'm not the sort of person who's gonna create something in great detail like you know well they're gonna look like this and they're all gonna be dressed like this or whatever i knew what guardians look like so it was like the function of the guardian was more my, you know, sort of thought. There, there needs to be guardians to guard portals. There aren't enough. So I've been asked to create some more. Then they could then be used as the guardians assigned them. They weren't my guardians. You know, it's like there was no ownership of anything. It was just like, no, okay. Yeah, I have permission to do this they just were released from that creative desire and there they were and then off they went when when i went with some others and i we were i think it was nancy and justin and a few others we were sort of engaging together and i sort of shared the story and nancy was i think oh can we, oh do, can we go and do that again can we do some more you know so i thought well I don't know let's go and let's go and see if that's what the father wants to do so we did felt that and of course nancy is very much more creative in the way she would do something and so she was like oh you're creating these things then she was describing what they look like and and everything like that and i was like, and it's great because that was her creative expression mm -hmm. we don't have to do it the same mm -hmm. now the end result was there were more guardians who could do more things which was great but the way we did it was an expression of the differences that we have as individual people, which is why I always want to ensure that whatever I do is is has integrity with who I am, that I'm not trying to do it like anybody else. Or try and, oh, this worked last time, I'll do this again. <clears throat> I want each time to feel like no, this is the creative process because someone who sat down at a canvas who's a painter is not going to paint exactly the same thing. Although their strokes may be the same and they may use the same technique because that's how they paint. But what they're going to do is express something differently. And if they were to maybe paint a picture of an angel, maybe the next time they would paint a picture of the angel, it wouldn't look exactly the same. 
So I think the creative process that I go through just gives me some checks and balances to ensure this is going to be an expression of who I am and then that can take place. Um, so I don't try and make it become, because it can feel like a bit of a formula. Oh, I go and brood here. I go do this. I go and do that. Oh, then I can go and do that. Mm -hmm. But it's much more of an interactive, creative process than just a formula of going step by step through the thing. And it creates in me opportunities for these checks and balances along the way that I don't just brood and immediately say, come forth. Now, you might brood and immediately say, come forth. That's fine. <laughs> you know, for me, I just feel uh, there's things that help me uh, along the process to be expressive of that, you know, in the way I do it. Um, you know, and it gives me a little bit of time to go through that process. So it's not just rush for me. You know, you know, I don't just think, oh, great, I'm going to go and do this right now. You know, it, it may be it may be during a session I might do it or it may be over a few days that I might do it, depending on you know what I feel and how I feel um, the urgency of it is. And sometimes this is something that God's desire for this to be birthed is totally integral with who I am. It's completely mm -hmm. around something that I am involved in and is to do with my destiny and no one else's. So God has sort of inspired me with something which was sort of integral with my life and destiny. Whereas other people may do things which are broader sometimes for other people and other things. Now, you know, I have done that um, as well. But I do feel there's there's a sense of we don't have to rush it. And brooding itself is not a rushed process, obviously. You know, it, it is a reflective coming into free, vibrating with the right frequency of God. You know, and when I first sit there, I might not be totally in sync. And my frequency has to entrain to his frequency for me to come into agreement and alignment with what his heart is or whatever you know, I'm being inspired to, to engage and bring to birth. Mm -hmm. So I, I do have another question similar to this one. Have you ever engaged with the cloud of witness and, um, you know, someone where Hebrews talks about them not fulfilling their promise mm -hmm. and father, you know, as you did with the guardians, that father wanted you to work with helping fulfill that promise um yes in in a way we are fulfilling all of their unfulfilled promises just being operating in this new covenant relationship with god because they were all looking forward to the day that we're in you know um and when you know abraham and moses and you know they sort of saw something you know, it says Abraham saw Jesus's day and was glad. Mm -hmm. You know, so they saw something of the future, but could that could not be fulfilled in the time that they were living or in the old covenant way of fulfillment. So it's only going to be birthed in the new covenant. So quite often I would see the things that we're doing as very much as the manifestation of what they would have desired but couldn't see in their time um and that they are you know some people would say that they're surrounding us cheering us on because they want to see the full expression of what they could only partially engage in their history in their time period um so but i don't i don't say Jacob is probably the only one. Jacob and Esther were the two that I think I engage with personally to which they then helped me fulfill or see the current fulfillment of what they were going through. So Jacob, Jacob's well, 
um, Jacob under an open heaven with a ladder going up to heaven, the house of God, Bethel, that all of that is an expression of our lives. We are now under an open heaven. We are the house of God. God dwells in us. He helped me to see that. But I also was able to see help him see the fulfillment in in who, who we are. And there was a sense where I wasn't telling him anything he didn't know it, it exactly. But but him birthing that understanding in me. And I could see an open heaven and me being a house of God brought joy to him. That I now caught on that I was the fulfillment of what he was talking about in Genesis, um, which was a joyful thing. You know, Esther, Esther came um, and I engaged with Esther. I went to the cloud of witnesses, engaged with Esther again. You know, her message was, you know, you've been called to the kingdom for a time such as this. Which got my attention, but actually what really got my attention in talking to her was the process she had to go through to get to the point where she was willing to accept that because she wasn't you know as a young jewish girl she didn't going to want to go in with some pagan king and be his concubine i mean that would be horrendous for a young jewish girl you know so it was almost like she had to come to the acceptance of that she was called to this and this was actually god you know who was who was used going to use her in this situation to save the nation so esther in a sense affirm that yes we are called for a time such as this and there's a purpose for us but she also affirmed i had to go through a whole process of you know purifying and refining which was the oils in preparation to see the king but that was the physical the spiritual was she had to come to terms with this was god giving her this mission which was much harder than being soaked in perfumes because she didn't want to be soaked in perfumes because she didn't want to go and be with the king so the whole process was a preparation for what she was going to do but actually the preparation of her heart to say yes I am prepared to do it. You know, I'm I'm willing to say yes, which was a harder thing than just going through a whole lot of beautification. You know, it was a change of her heart which took place. And that's what she, I think, helped me to see that each of us has to go through changes of heart to come into an agreement, to accept who we are and to accept who God has made us to be and come into agreement with that. Yeah. Which so that's is part of that brooding then, right? Uh, when we're brooding, we are taking on whatever our intention is in the brooding. We're taking on that frequency of father's heart. Yes. It, and if it needs, if our hearts needs changed at that point, that's part of that process. Yes. Yeah. That would be okay. part of the process. Definitely. Okay. Um, because we we have to come into alignment with his hearts and accept that this is actually that's the destiny part for me you know i can come into agreement with the father's heart but actually is this in line with me and my destiny and that's where i you know and if the father's asking me i know the answer is yes but i have to come to the point where i am accepting of that and then willing um because yes. sometimes there's timing in it as well you know that god has a timing for certain things and therefore there are stages to the outworking of that timing but you know the the brooding part is the me being reflective enough in god's heart to allow him to show me what his intentions and desires are and it's like when jesus only did what he saw the father doing that was because jesus was in the father's heart and the father was in his heart so they were already already in total sync and tune but jesus engaged as a man for that revelation of how he was going to outwork it on earth and he chose to do it as jesus 
he didn't choose to do it as well the father's giving me detailed instructions here and i'm just going to complete it he did it as the son of god a son of man through him himself through his creative ability you know and and i think i think sometimes people think well god just gave jesus a whole list of things to do and told him how to do it i think jesus creatively chose to outwork the father's heart differently every day and I think deliberately so to show us, look, there's no formula here. Don't just assume you're going to lay hands on someone. Don't just assume you're going to speak. Make sure that you're in tune with the father's desires, but you express the father's desires through yourself. You know, so it is an expression of your sonship that you outwork the father's heart. And that is why when I engaged the Chamber of Destiny, that's where that really forms it's like okay how am i going to do this you know i have the authority i know the father's heart but how am i going to do this that's in line with me you know because there's always a temptation to do it like someone else has done it you know um because well you've got you've heard what someone else does so i'll do it like that but i always want to give the space for me to be able to outwork it through who i am which is why i think it helps for me to have particular checkpoints along the way which sort of now all that process could happen in five minutes you know it could do if it was very very clearly it. but often you know i give myself the space the breathing space to be able to sort of process it you know in a way and then I'm also feeling, look, this isn't just magic. I don't just wave a magic wand and say abracadabra and something forms. That is why I engage with living light, because that then is the connection to creation for its manifestation. I want to personally connect to creation, and that is light, you know, for light to manifest, the energy of light to manifest in something of a reality shift or change or whatever it might be and that for me is like i am engaging with creation i'm not making something happen here you know or forcing it to happen here light responds to me as i've responded to god and then i'm interactively sort of co connecting with creation in a way which is relational feels like there's a relational connection i'm not giving orders I don't go there and bark orders and command them to do something. I share the father's heart through how I express that heart to them, usually vocally. And they align creatively with that. But it's a relational process. And I sense that relationship that's going on uh, in that process. You know, it is very much a birthing of is something living not just something okay here's just a, a technical process that i'm going to go through it, it is a living process for me to how that works oh that was very good thank you mike okay so my mike yeah <laughs> your sons of issachar last article was tremendous about the power of intention okay yeah and um over the course of my lifetime so far um you know intention when it becomes um okay how am i i'm trying to articulate what i'm feeling about it so when i was a child about six years old i was told by a family member some pretty bad things and that, that those words that he spoke over my life uh, has affected me comp my whole adult life until my mom died. And uh, when she died, I went through her, her things and I found some photographs that she had um, that she had saved. And all of a sudden I looked at it and I said, oh, there she is at six years old. It wasn't the truth of what I was told. 
So the thing that I realized was um, God said to me, well, I never saw you the way you were told you look or behave or, you know, it was a very derogatory negative thing. And I thought, well, because that individual was significant in my life, it must be the truth. So as I have been changing my thought processes with um, my belief systems, of not only personally, but even from a religious standpoint, when leadership would, I, I would um, progress to a certain degree and then leadership would just stop the progression as if I was looking for affirmation from them, yeah. right? Yeah. So the whole process of changing your thought patterns, I always ask the question when I get a negative thought, well, a, a doubtful thought, whatever it is, yeah. did that you know who said that who told you that that come from the father's heart no because he's a hundred percent love mm -hmm. so when i so during the course of my life and now um really i feel like that as i'm dealing with i have intentions and as i meditate on them i brood over them you know that is really the reality that I want to manifest. But you have to remove the negative thought processes and replace it with the truth of who God says you are and what his heart's desire is for you, which is always good, 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. It's always good. So then once you connect your heart with the intent, then you, there's a place where I've come where I just rest. I cease from my own effort. I I know there has been a shift in my mind, and now I'm waiting for it to manifest. And sometimes it takes a while, but then I keep brooding over it, and and I I um, I um, it, it you know it's a it's a process of changing that thought that thought pattern to positive and it's not a power positive thinking it's replacing what your negative thought pattern is with the truth of who he says you are and where what where your life is going so that is a i would recommend that sons of issachar 343 i think is the number absolutely amazing perfect timing was very inside and i'm i'm sitting here going yeah that's exactly what i'm going through and so when god says something about healing the healing is already ours we are to live in complete wholeness because that is who that is the provision that he's given us but then we go to a physician and he totally negates what it is that we're trying to manifest True. right because he mm -hmm. is strictly, he is strictly basing his uh, diagnosis on his education. You know, he's learned, it's like, I, I just look at it as a glorified mechanic. He learned, he has learned the body. He has learned how the body functions only to a part, not completely. They they don't know all, all of the ins and outs of the body. And so we go to a doctor, we pay him money and we say, you know, what's the diagnosis, sir? And then he says, well, you have diabetes or you have this or that. And pretty soon the fear comes in. But what did God say about that? What was if you are supposed to walk in complete wholeness, then your your belief system and your your mind, your thought processes have to change into the truth of what he says and the provision that he's given. So um, sometimes I feel like Esther in this place of preparation. And uh, it has been an amazing year so far. And I'm just saying, okay, let's keep going here. Let's keep pressing into this. this. And the more you know him, and you know, I always use 1 Corinthians 13 as my plumb line for life, the love chapter. And and that's the thing that really is the key, is that God's love is 100% for us. 
He doesn't make us suffer. He doesn't do any of those things that we have been taught. Well, you have to go through suffer, suffer to establish character. Come on now. You know, mm -hmm. there's a point where, there's a point where um, I don't look at uh, trials and testing in a negative way. I embrace it and I say, okay, well, teach me what it is I need to learn. Change my heart change my mind so I can understand exactly what it is that is going to manifest in your life. And it's all about love. You can't love unconditionally unless your heart's been transformed or your mind's been transformed. Right. And so uh, anyway, I just wanted to say very, very excellent, excellent, excellent. I have sent that. I have sent that around to a group of people that I connect with all over every, all over the States. And I go, you guys got to read this because it's really, it was really to the point. Anyway, anyway, thanks. Thank you very much. And I do read almost, I do read every one of those that you send out because they're so meaty. They're so full of life and uh, it's really good, Mike. So thanks so much. Well, you're welcome i mean it isn't actually me who puts those out jeremy does that mostly um i usually do the videos and he then takes the stuff and puts it into some sort of word format because some people like reading you know it, it reading some people they, they when they read they can be slower about it and and mull it over while they're reading and i and i and i get that which is why you know why we why we do the blog um in that way because it just gives bite-sized chunks um that people can just spend the time looking over and reading uh, but absolutely when god calls us into something there's always a transformation that takes place in us rather than just what we're being used to form at some sort of change it's always going to change us because to come into agreement with God, we, we, we have to change anything that's in disagreement with God or that has to be changed. You know, I can't renew my own mind. Yeah. God can renew my mind by revealing truth. Right. I, the way it, it used to work was we're going to try and renew a mind. So we're going to get some truth and we're going to meditate and speak it out until we believe it. Well, all you've done is try to change your belief about something you've not got an experience of that which is now firmly a testimony of that reality and so i try to change my beliefs by modifying what i believe usually using a bible verse lots of times in the past but actually i was focusing on the negative of what i didn't believe exactly. you know I'm trying to change my belief well, if you're change, trying to change a belief, you're always thinking about what you're trying to change. But an encounter with the truth, a revealing of the truth, God giving us truth will change what we believe because it's changed what we've experienced. You know, and when we experience, you know, I can tell everyone in the world about unconditional love. And they'll think, oh, that's wonderful. But if they've not experienced it, all it is is a belief about unconditional love but not a testimony of unconditional love. And God wants us to have experience, to know, which is to know by experience, not to know intellectually, everything. And most people are vibrating with the frequency of the problem when they're trying to change the problem. If you vibrate with the frequency of the answer and the solution, then that is a higher frequency than that of the problem. And the problem will always entrain and come in alignment with the higher frequency. If we try and focus on the negative frequency, we'll just be living in the negative frequency. So it's always having a higher frequency. The truth will change whatever might be a fact. And when that happens, then there is a knowing that it's been done. It's done. You don't have to revisit that. And, and then you wait for it to manifest. Yeah. And that's, that's the difference. We don't have to keep after it. There, there is a knowing like you know that you know that you know. And there's yeah. no doubt in that thought process at all because you, you know the outcome is going to be good. 
Absolutely. And therefore you rest in it. So many people are striving for change. They're striving for their healing. They're striving for the change of circumstances. They're tr striving for their finances or whatever the blessing might be that they're looking for. They're striving for it, pressing in. You know, so many people, I'm pressing in with God for it. Well, then you're not at rest. Right. So much harder to receive something that you're trying to get. Yeah. You know? The other the other caveat to that is that it's already been done. It's already available. All you have to do is change your thinking about it and receive it. Well, it sounds like yeah, it's pretty easy, but it is a process of changing your mind, you know, with the truth, our healing, it's already available. All you have to do is your, it has to connect with your heart. You know, anything we have need of, it's already available. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's one of those things that you get this sort of thing. People find it difficult to get the finished work of Christ and me living in the finished work of Christ. And it's like Jesus has done everything necessary for everything, all life and godliness. Everything's available. But if I don't believe that, then I'm not going to receive it. Yeah, you know, it is true, but is it true for me? And the process of it becoming true for me often happens, and this is how God does it, that I believe that I've received it before it manifests. So you live, as you say, in the rest that you'll know 100% that that is the truth. Then the manifestation comes. And we change in the process of coming to agreement that it is true. We're the, we're the change. The truth hasn't changed. We've just aligned to the truth that's already true. But now it becomes true for me. And then yeah. I come and, and say to the Lord, I am so grateful for what you are doing. Hmm. When we're grateful for what, even if we can't see it manifest yet, our heart is connecting with him. And I am grateful, Father, for your love. Hmm. I'm so grateful for what you're doing. And I can't wait to just step into the next thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think what what i think the misunderstanding with this is that people think either it's automatic well god's done it therefore it's automatic and i'm not really involved it's automatic and then they get disillusioned and disappointed because it isn't automatic the other issue is you only have to believe it and jesus didn't say that truth that you believe will set you free he said the truth that you know will set you free. He didn't even say the truth will set you free. He said the truth that you know will set you free. And to know was to have the full experience of it. Even if it hadn't happened yet, you're living within the reality of that experience even before it's fully manifested. You are content within it, not striving for it, you're at rest within it, even though it's not yet come, because you now know that's true. Rather than you're trying to believe it's true. And ultimately, that is a process. It's hard when people have symptoms that counteract that reality. I had the same thing when I went through a healing process. I had the symptoms. I was taking medication. That was always... The sort of, well, what are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the symptoms that you have? Or are you going to believe the healing that is yours? And it took time to believe the healing more than the symptoms. So the symptoms became irrelevant to my knowing health. That, that was what happened. I didn't just believe, well, I'm going to be healed. I believed health was my full inheritance and that changed the whole reality and then god said it's done you know you can stop taking the tablets because if i'd stopped taking the tablets to prove that i believed it wouldn't have been true i would have been this is my step of faith 
And I would be trying to effectively force God to do something because I've got all this faith that I don't need to take the tablets anymore. And most people don't have that faith. They just think that that would be the thing they need to do. And I would encourage no one to stop taking medication until God tells you to. Because you need to be living within the reality of healing even before you stop taking the medication or actually the doctor says, hey, you haven't got this anymore, or whichever way you want to do it. But that is what we're we're living in the reality. Then that enables the reality to manifest. But I've changed. M my thinking has changed. I didn't change it. It changed when I started to look at the solution. God is my healer. Health is my inheritance. I didn't. I stopped asking for healing. I stopped thinking about being healed. I didn't give healing another notion. My thinking was health. God is my healer. Health is my inheritance. That is where, where my 100% focus was. I started off with I need to be healed. You know, I, my focus was I need to be healed. I don't want to be taking this medication. I don't want it affecting me. I don't like the side effects. I want to be healed. I don't want this you know, incurable disease. I want to be healed. And I, and I, so I need to focus. How do I, I'm going to confess healing scriptures. I'm going to, you know, well, in the process of reading about healing, I discovered God is my healer. Healing was my inheritance. Health was my inheritance. Then my whole thinking shifted away from I'm trying to be healed to I'm living in health. God is my healer. I'm living in health. You know, then the manifestation came. Yeah. And I think that is don't focus on the negative, trying to change it. Focus on the positive and live in it. And I think that's where the manifestations begin to come when we're living in the good of what is true. And nothing can shape that reality from us because it is now my whole truth is I am in health. So, but it is, as you say, process of focusing in the right thing to actually align us with what is the truth, not trying to believe the truth, but actually living in the truth. Because then it will set us free because we know it, not just trying to believe it. I spent a lot of time trying to believe something. When I knew it, everything changed. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.